Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and very welcome to the IO Medical Center and the uh, Swedberg Hall. My name is Stellan Sand, I'm Vice Director for the Domain Medicine and Pharmacy, and uh, this is a really great event when the Nobel Prize laureates in medicine and physiology are visiting us every year. And we very much look forward to, to this year's lecture. So I immediately will give the word to Don Larohammer, who will give a first presentation. Thank you very much, Stella. As uh, Michael Rosberg pointed out in his speech at the Nobel banquet a few days ago, this year's prize is the fifth that has been awarded to discoveries made in the famous fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. Of these, this year's prize rewards the discoveries that have had the most immediate impact on vertebrate physiology, including humans, namely the circadian regulation. Every human being must think of the practical consequences of this molecular machinery every day. In the mid-1980s, I had the great fortune as a PhD student and postdoc to follow in real time as the reports were published the scientific drama describing how the functions of the Drosophila period locus was deciphered. It started in 1984 when two articles with fellow laureate Jeff Hall were published in Cell, the identification of an oscillating transcript from the now legendary period gene, and then the transfer of this gene to restore rhythm in a mutant. This work demonstrated with overwhelming and stunning clarity how a single gene could profoundly influence a complex behavior. Later, his laboratory identified several additional genes involved in the Drosophila circadian system, cycle, clock, and cryptochrome. Michael Rosbash got his PhD in 1970 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge. And after a three-year postdoctoral spell in Edinburgh, he returned to Massachusetts in 1974 to Brandeis University in Waltham. This is where his laboratory made these uh, breakthrough discoveries. In 1989, he became an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Brandeis University, and he is a professor of biology at Brandeis University. He was elected to the US National Academy of Sciences in two 2003. So with this lecture, uh, fly circadian ryth rhythms and neuroscience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Michael Rosbash. Th thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I probably should give a couple of introductory remarks. First of all, I think until this week, I've, I've given a lecture in a suit maybe twice in my life. <laughs> and, 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 and one of them was at a funeral. So, <laughs> so, so this is a whole new experience, I guess. The, the second anecdote I should say is that uh, a few years ago, not so many, uh, I, I went to Cuba for a few days as a tourist with, with my postdoc advisor. Um, the two of us met, uh, two old guys, uh, to, to reconnect and spend a few days in Havana. And of course, as a, as a US citizen, this is a complicated, this was a complicated venture. And I ended up have, giving one lecture at the Biotechnology Institute in Havana, which was more or less an excuse to not be arrested when I returned to the United States. <laughs> and, and uh, the director met me. They, they have 25,000 employees at this place and a huge research endeavor. And the director met me and I had a tour and, and they took me to the, up, up to where I was giving my lecture. And, and, and I appeared and, and there were four people. Uh, I gave this lecture at this huge place to four people and actually it was very pleasant. It was like a group meeting, so forth. So this is a whole, you can see this is a whole new experience for me uh, here. So. Last introductory point, I'm going to give a, a, a contemporary seminar, something not very different than I would give if I were speaking at a U.S. university and there had been no prize associated with this because 
I'm not going to give you the same talk that I, that I gave for the Nobel lecture, which focused on the early work for which the prize was awarded. So let me tell you something about neuroscience. Whoops. Um, here we go. So, so uh, the, the, uh, the, the people with the, the candles woke us this morning at 7 a.m. and came into <laughs> to our room uh, singing, so this was a, a treat with, with coffee. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, circadian rhythms, um, a ancient uh, and nearly ubiquitous, the response uh, of, of organisms to this, this inexorable rotation of the Earth, which existed before uh, the atmosphere had its current uh, gaseous constitution, before nutrition was anything, resembled anything like what we, what we have today. And, and, and here's, here's sort of the deal. Uh, and, and of course, circadian means about a day, because our endogenous rhythms are not exactly 24 hours, but they're, uh, they're entrained by the 24-hour light-dark cycle. So we have a clock, we meaning humans, that runs 15 hours, 15 hours, 15 sec, 15 minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> runs about 15 minutes long every day, and, and light resets our clock, advances our clock back to square one so that we're, we're every day we're on track, right? So that's the, that's the principle of entrainment. And uh, the two uh, purposes uh, broadly, broadly described are anticipation. The early bird gets the worm and the early worm avoids being eaten by the bird. And, and secondly, coherence, that, that stuff that goes on inside an organism happens in an order and it's better to segregate those biochemical reactions, if you will, uh, than have them all occurring at the same, at the same time. And so today's uh, as the slide says, today's neurocentric story really has to do with the connections of the brain, the fly brain, and the circadian neurons in the fly brain to the behavior, and, and the technical advance, if you will, the things that we've been interested in for the last uh, small number of years. A subgroup in my lab is, is how to monitor uh, neuronal activity in wake behaving uh, animals. And so I, I, I must pay significant lip service to, to the beginnings of all this, to Ron Kanapka and Seymour Benzer, who isolated uh, these mutants in fruit flies that had altered circadian rhythms. For those students among you, I should point out that this paper had uh, about 10 citations in the first decade after it was produced. So when, if you chase high-profile papers, they will not necessarily live on in history and, and uh, as a complimentary statement, there are papers that were not so high profile that turn out to be unbelievably um, uh, salient. And so, uh, the, 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 this is, uh, on your left, is a locomotor activity profile of a wild type, of wild type Drosophila. And uh, the, the point here is that the activity events marked by little, little uh, tick marks uh, with the light dark cycle above, this does not, this is not good enough, um, uh, are every day uh, the same as the day before, so a very regular pattern. And uh, on the right hand side is the, is the phenotype of, thank you, the phenotype of per short mutants, right, that's better, the phenotype of per short mutants, and every day the pattern starts and ends about four or five hours earlier than the day before. So that was the striking, one of the striking phenotypes that they um, identified. And here's how these experiments were done then, more or less, and how they're done today. One fruit fly in a tube, little food at the bottom, a stopper at the top, and, and that uh, tube is put into an apparatus. There's a uh, infrared light source and, and, a, and, a, and a, a, a receptor. If, on opposite sides of the tube. This is a beam brake device. It's used for rodents and other organisms. The fly runs back and forth, breaks the light beam. The flies can't see in the infrared, so the light doesn't disturb the flies. And when there's a lot of activity, they're running back and forth, and you get a lot of activity events. And when they're resting, in fact sleeping, then uh, you get no activity events. And so, 
<clears throat> as as um, uh, as I described in the Nobel lecture, uh, we really came to this realization through the work of Paul Hardin in my laboratory that there was a feedback loop in which the product of the period gene, the period protein itself, uh, inhibited its own gene expression. Uh, and, and the proposal was that it interacted with the positive transcription factor, originally described as X, because we didn't know what it was, um, and, th and that that would turn off gene expression, and it took 24 hours for this process to, for expression to go up, go back down, the protein to decay, and then the business start all over again. And, and it was uh, really uh, after 17 years or so from the beginning of this uh, journey to 1998 when, when uh, clock and cycle, or in mammals, clock and BMAL uh, were cloned, X was identified. There was an additional repressor protein, uh, timeless in flies, as uh, described by Mike Young and his colleagues. Uh, cryptochrome in mammals uh, that was involved in the feedback loop, but we realized by this point, uh, not through our own work, I might add, that, that the exact same process occurred in mammals, and, and we were dealing with uh, a, a, a <coughs> phenomena that already existed 550 or 600 million years ago in the last common ancestor between flies and mammals. And so, that's sort of where the process stood at that point, and in the intervening years, since <clears throat> in, the, in the almost two decades, since that picture was uh, realized, first of all, we, we now know that the trans positive transcription factor rhythmically cycles on and off direct target genes, and I won't go into any detail here, but these are CHIP-seq profiles, in which the positive transcription factors are going on the regulatory elements of their direct target genes, including period and timeless, and, and then coming off those genes. And that, that, that regulation is, is responsible for driving these direct target genes. And <clears throat> that uh, small feedback loop, uh, colors have changed here, unfortunately, uh, but that, that feedback loop in which period and timeless, or period and cryptochrome in mammals, um, going back into the nucleus, turning off gene expression, uh, actually uh, occurs for additional transcription factors. And, and th those transcription factors give rise to the oscillation of secondary target genes, uh, tertiary target genes, if there's another layer. This is the temporal equivalent of the classic spatial regulation of gene expression during embryonic development, and, and one ends up with, uh, with really thousands of oscillating genes. And this is a heat map uh, from liver, from mammalian liver, showing that there are a large number of oscillating genes, oscillating transcripts, and, and, and they are present really around the clock. So there are <coughs> genes which peak at various times, and if you add up the oscillating gene expression um, from different tissues, from different tissues, then at least 50% of the genome um, is oscillating. And, and I should say this large number of, of transcripts, this is not, I learned uh, this morning um, that this is not how Linnaeus is spelt in Swedish, but we do what we can. Um, <clears throat> and of course, it's, it's due to these oscillating transcripts or their equivalent in plants that flowers uh, appear at, at different times of day, just like different messenger RNAs uh, appear at, at, different, uh, at, at different times of day. So, so a connection to the 18th century in, in Uppsala. Uh, and so because of this huge uh, and vast regulation of gene expression, we end up, uh, I, I should say, we end up where we are today, and by that I mean uh, Mike, Jeff, and I end up where we are today, and the field ends up where it is today because of the fact that all kinds of mammalian physiology is regulated uh, <coughs> by uh, the circadian clock. And, and uh, I want to segue to uh, a contemporary story in neuroscience 
by talking a little bit about the circadian regulation of sleep. And in fact, Mike, I I'm bet, is going to elaborate on this theme from a mammalian perspective, from a human, even a human perspective, and I'm going to talk about this from a, from a circadian perspective. That namely, the circadian regulation of sleep and wake, and of course, this complements a homeostatic regulation where, whereby on uh, Saturday and Sunday, at least the young people in this room sleep much longer than they do from Sunday to Thursday to make up for lost sleep. That's, that's homeostatic regulation. And circadian regulation is the fact that in my university, uh, where we have these talks at four in the afternoon, uh, a third of the audience is asleep because that's the circadian nadir of alertness. Um, and, so, and so there's really these, these, two, these two regulatory systems which intersect to control, to control sleep. And so uh, the fly brain. Why would you study this problem in the fly brain? And, and the reason is because <clears throat> this very complicated small region of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the so-called master oscillator, um, master oscillator in, in mammals and in humans, has its equivalent in the fly of only 75 pairs of neurons. So there's a very small, highly uh, anatomically um, distinct region in the fly brain, which is the equivalent of the 10,000 neurons um, present here. So this is uh, spaghetti, uh, that is the, the anatomical relationship of those 10,000 neurons. Uh, I should say the field, the mammalian field is making pr serious progress in deconvoluting that spaghetti. Um, but nonetheless, it's a formidable task compared to uh, these 75 neurons shown in red here, stained with an anti-per antibody, uh, in which they're divided into uh, a few very highly distinct groups, each group containing from six to 20 uh, neurons. So we have a very simple organization. Whoops, I wonder why that didn't, uh... okay, I'm missing a piece. Anyway, we have a very, a very simple organization um, that, that uh, is, is, is a foundation for further investigations. And the work I'm going to describe has been done mostly um, by a, a fantastic postdoc, Fang Guo, who's on his way to a faculty job back in China, and a graduate student who graduated six or eight months ago and has now a, a postdoc at MIT. Uh, so, so here we are. Ooh, okay, so this is now. Uh, uh, here are the 75 neurons, um, as I said, shown in red. And, and the interesting feature is that if we were to stain these neurons, 12 hours later with the same uh, antibody, then there would, be no, um, there would be no detectable expression. So, so the amount of uh, staining or the amount of protein that's detectable uh, is, is high uh, at one time of day and 12 hours later is essentially, is essentially undetectable. So the, the famous oscillations that we discovered, of course, not surprisingly occur within these uh, key neurons, and they occur in sync. So that the timing of all of this is, is indistinguishable. And, and the question is, uh, how do these 75 neurons uh, dictate the, the classic Drosophila locomotor activity pattern, which was used by Benzer and colleagues to, to characterize uh, their, their initial mutant strains? And, and in a light-dark cycle, um, this this um, pattern is characterized by two major peaks of activity, a peak in the morning uh, and a peak in the evening. And, and what you should notice uh, is, is that these activity peaks anticipate the discontinuous light transitions that occur in the incubator. In other words, the light snaps on and snaps off. This is unlike natural conditions, of course, where the light gradually gets more intense. But the point here is that the fly knows when the light is going to appear because it gets active in advance of that event, right? Um, <clears throat> and so uh, these, these morning and activity peaks are even um, apparent in the original Kanopka and Benzer data 
because here's, here's evening activity um, and here's morning activity uh, there. And so, circled. And so the, the, about a decade ago, actually more than that now, um, my, my group and Francois Rier's group discovered that individual subsets of these neurons were separately responsible for morning and evening activity. In other words, one group of cells, so-called morning cells, uh, was, was responsible for the morning peak, and another subgroup of cells was responsible for evening peak. They, they talk to each other, but they can work in a cell autonomous fashion. One can eliminate or silence one group, and the other peak and the other neurons take over for the other group. Now, you'll, you'll appreciate the fact that if the molecular program is all in sync, there's an implicit question, namely, how do these two groups do different things um, if the molecular program is all in sync. Uh, retain that, if you, if you like, as a, as a, as a sort of back, backdrop. And so it turns out that, that uh, four cells uh, illustrated here are, are really responsible for that evening peak. This is now giving you a bit of detail on the generalization that I just made. Those four cells dictate evening locomotor activity and an illustration uh, of, of this control is shown here in, in, in this slide. N namely, um, if we speed up the clock, taking advantage of, of a gene that, that Mike's lab identified, a very important kinase, CK1 or double time, and if we overexpress an allele of this kinase, which speeds up the clock, that's its, that's its purpose here, but we only express it in those four neurons, then, then this evening activity peak is accelerated or advanced um, by comparison to the control or by comparison to putting this gene in another set of cells. So that's an illustration that it's really the speed of the clock in those cells which is determining the timing of when that evening activity peak appears. That's, that's uh, uh, um, uh, an, an illustration of this. Um, and, it, and these cells are also, as the slide says, they're a major source of locomotor activity drive. So we get more activity when we increase the, the uh, firing rate of those cells and we get less total activity. The flies are more quiescent, they move around less when we silence, uh, when we silence those uh, cells. And, and so here's, here's the uh, so, so new, uh, what was a year and a half ago or so when we published this, uh, a new concept for the field that is not only are there cells which drive activity, which was mm, suspected and, and even, even uh, indicated from the literature, but some of those 75 neurons actually drive sleep. And, and of course the pattern uh, that I showed you not only has activity peaks, but it has rest periods in between, a siesta, nighttime sleep, uh, and of course, mountains, two mountains necessitate a valley in between because you can't have the mountains without a valley, right? And so, and so the point here is that that valley is actually regulated and there are discrete sets of cells which are responsible for suppressing activity, promoting sleep, both in the daytime, the siesta, which I desperately need, I might add, um, and, and, uh, and nighttime sleep. And so it turns out we identified uh, a small subset of circadian neurons, uh, four to five cells present here, which, which drive uh, that, sleep, uh, that, that sleep epoch. And, and uh, to take us to sort of a modern era and to mm, mimic or uh, to use the contemporary parlance in America, to channel our mammalian colleagues, um, we, we, we can optogenetically stimulate uh, highly specific cells, which are either the activity-promoting E cells or the sleep-promoting DN1s, and, and using uh, very, uh, very dedicated drivers for the mammalian people here. These, these are the equivalent of Cree lines in mammals from Genelia, uh, made by the Genelia research 
uh, campus, Jerry Rubin and his colleagues, that are highly specific for these subsets of cells. And so the, the virtue of the fly is you don't need, one of the many virtues is you don't need a, uh, an optic cable going into some place in the brain. The fly is so small and transparent that you can, you can do optogenetic stimulation by irradiating, the, by illuminating the, uh, the animal uh, with, with the dedicated laser light. And so uh, in order to do all of this, we have uh, migrated from this traditional monitoring device that I described to you initially to a, uh, a sort of home-built device which we call Flybox. And, and, the, and the key to Flybox is that we, we record movement or locomotor activity uh, by, by uh, video recording the flies. We do this in 96 well plates, the same kind of plates that are used by biochemists to do high throughput analysis. The flies actually have much more room to move around in each of those wells in the 96 well plate. Um, and, and we can illuminate more successfully with either red light or green light uh, to either activate or inhibit uh, specific channel rhodopsins uh, to then activate or inhibit specific cells. So, so that's the setup, and, and as you would predict from what I've told you, uh, <coughs> if we uh, activate with uh, crimson these uh, activity-promoting neurons, um, then we, when we turn on the laser, we immediately get an enhanced amount of activity, and whereas when we do the same experiment, with the sleep-promoting uh, cells, then we immediately suppress activity as soon as, as, soon as the light goes on. And, and I'm not going to show you, in the interest of time, the, the complementary inhibitory um, data. That, that very useful chloride uh, channel rhodopsin it comes from uh, a, a, a former student, Claridge Chang, Adam Claridge Chang of, of Mike Young's, who really contributed that to the Drosophila community. So, so we have this model based on what we've done really in the last couple of years that, that these, uh, these sleep-promoting DN1s, and I've not shown you, but I'll just tell you that they're glutamatergic. And in the fruit fly, unlike in mammals, the, the, major, um, the major excitatory neurotransmitter is acetylcholine and glutamate acts primarily in flies as an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter through G protein coupled receptors. Uh, and and that, it's that pathway by which these sleep promoting DN1s inhibit the activity promoting morning and evening cells. And that's a circadian function and that's what gives rise to the siesta primarily and, and to some extent nighttime sleep. So, to summarize this part, these are the first sleep-promoting circadian neurons and, and the first adult circadian neurons that actually function via inhibition, that don't just uh, work in an excitatory fashion. So let, let me turn to two questions. Um, what are the individual firing patterns um, <clears throat> and how do they relate to locomotor activity behavior? And secondly, is, is a technical um, issue, which I think is of general interest, namely to people who work in mammals as well as flies, is how do you actually monitor discrete neuronal activity in freely moving behavioral animals? And by that I mean if you have a pair of mice who are foraging, feeding, fighting, mating, and, and you'd really love to have a little implant into only a few key neurons in different parts of the brain and ask the question, when are they firing, right? So, so tracking the activity of those neurons um, as well as being able to activate and inhibit them gives you a full toolkit to really, to really explore the problem. And so the, the way we've gone about this is to take advantage of reporter genes uh, or a reporter system that was originally devised by the Wang Lab or Li Ching Lo's lab, uh, a Brandeis PhD, I might add, um, famous neuroscientist. And, and these, um, basically, uh, they have developed transcription factors which are sensitive to calcium. 
These two systems work differently. One, one has a piece of NFAT, uh, an important T-cell factor, which enters the nucleus in a calcium-dependent fashion. The other one uh, takes advantage of an association between calmodulin and a calmodulin binding peptide, which is calcium sensitive. And, and the principle is that transcription can be, can be, uh, can be uh, tied to calcium. My lord, my lord. We start a little late, five, 11. You're supposed to start at 11. Um, let me see what I can do here other than commit seppuku. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so the idea, what we've tried to do, and, and I'm, I'm not going to talk faster and faster and faster. I'm going to just stop right at some point in a, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, the, the, the idea is that we place these reporters in discrete cells, even single cells, and then, and then these, these uh, flies uh, are monitored in a, in a luminometer, that is one fly in each of those 96 wells, they're running around, they're doing their thing, and, and then we can, over circadian time, over many days, monitor the amount of luciferase. Turns out the system is so sensitive that you can actually assay the amount of luciferase uh, that, that, that comes from, from these animals. And, of course, as you would imagine, um, there are discrete patterns of luciferase that, that come from either the activity-promoting E cells or the sleep-promoting uh, DN1s. And, and those patterns correspond um, to, to, a, uh, to a really attractive extent, gratifyingly, to the activity patterns. And I'm going to sort of skip ahead here and see if I can show, here, here's sort of one very interesting slide, I think, in which in constant darkness, this is the locomotor activity pattern uh, of these flies, and, and, and this is the luciferase pattern from the evening cells um, from this reporter. And I think you can see that this pattern really tracks um, strikingly well the general activity of those flies in constant darkness. In other words, if you combine with the fact that, um, that activating those cells promotes activity and inhibiting those cells suppresses activity, uh, we, we really have the sense that those, those cells are firing when activity takes place. And, and um, I'm, I'm going to simply say that we have an orthogonal system for, uh, for doing the same thing which turns out to be more sensitive and it comes from the PhD work from my student Xiao and what she did was identify immediate early genes or their equivalent, we call them activity regulated genes in the fly um, because the equivalent of FOSS and June doesn't exist in the fruit fly. In other words, a gene whose expression is upregulated by neuronal activity and, and we were mystified why that is the case and of course we are missing a tool uh, as a consequence of, of that absence. So she spent a considerable fraction of her PhD uh, asking for looking for genes where uh, neuronal activity would, would drive the expression and, and she, one of the screens she did was done with, with channel rhodopsin that is to uh, to stimulate, uh, broadly stimulate the nervous system of the fly. And, and she turned those genes she found into reporters that resemble what I showed you with the, with the Trick Luke reporter, namely multimerizing um, the upstream regions from these genes and then actually taking advantage of a, of a very important strategy in, the, in, the, in the fly genetics to make it highly specific for, for specific circadian genes. And I, and I think I'll show you one slide taking advantage of these new reporters. And so here is a single fly assay um, in which in yellow is the activity pattern, evening activity, morning activity, evening activity, morning activity, siesta time, siesta time, siesta time, siesta time, 
uh, nighttime sleep, et cetera. And you'll notice that these sleep-promoting DN1s, siesta-promoting DN1s, show activity, even in a single fly um, basis, that really corresponds to the, to the rest period or the siesta period of the fly. So these are very sensitive reporters, can be done in very small numbers of neurons, and then can be correlated through the fly box and the luminometer technology to activity. And so uh, I'll simply tell you that this can be done with single neurons. That is one neuron in which these reporters are placed, and we get a pattern which, which makes sense. And, um, and in the interest of not running over and leaving a few minutes for questions, uh, I'm, I'm simply going to uh, turn to you know, the, the, the cultural, uh, this, this, is our, this is illustrating both, of course, our, our history as, as kids who grew up in the 50s, Mike and I, and, and as well as uh, some features of contemporary politics in the United States. Um, <clears throat> so thank you very much. Some neuroscientists must have a question. Look at that. Everyone is stunned. Right, right. That's one. That's the optimistic interpretation. <laughs> so, <laughs> Michael, which question do you usually get? Oh my God. Um, what, 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 what? It would be a usual question. And well, this week, this week has given rise to a series of questions which are quite different from the ones that I, I would normally which are quite different from the ones I would normally get. You should really ask away. It doesn't have to be restricted to this, uh, to this topic. But, you know, you must be curious about something, right? Right. How much basketball did I play? <laughs> right. What are my children? Did my children become scientists? Right. Something. There's a question. So I've heard that you can't make up lost sleep. Sorry? I've heard you have it. You can't make up lost sleep. Like once you lose sleep, like you can't really make me, it me up. Me personally or no, in general? No, just like in general. <laughs> Those are two very di right. Uh, so, sure you can make okay. up lost sleep. Yeah. That's what happens on the weekend to all of you, I'm sure, or or most of you, young people, right? So this is why this is why uh, young people sleep till noon or two, judging from my children, right? Two, 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 two in the afternoon, 1400, uh, on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning when you don't have to, get, you're making up for the sleep, for the sleep deprivation that has accumulated during, during the week. And flies, by the way, this, this experiment works identically for fruit flies. You sleep deprive fruit flies and they sleep more. And they actually sleep more intensely. So we do two things when that happens. We sleep longer and, and we sleep deeper. So by a, variety of, by a variety of criteria. So no, you can make up for lost sleep. Actually, when I say you, um, I, I gave a lecture at, at Hughes many years ago and there were 200 high school students in the audience and, and we asked the question, how many of you sleep on, uh, on the weekend? And almost everybody ra raised their hand but there were two students, two out of 200 maybe, 1%, um, who, who didn't, or when we asked the opposite question, two people raised their hands. And so their, their circadian drive, or they were such early birds that, that despite the lack of sleep, there were two people who woke up at 6.30 in the morning, you know, 17-year-olds, very unusual, um, who woke up at, on a Saturday and Sunday morning, even if they had gone to a party and gone to bed at three in the morning, they still woke up at seven in the morning. They could not make up for lost sleep. And of course, you could discuss why, you know, maybe it's a homeostatic problem or a circadian problem, but the point is 
that the general rule of thumb is you certainly can make up lost sleep. Mike and I, or at least I, I haven't actually asked him, but I can't do that nearly as well, and old flies can't do that nearly as well as young flies, right? So um, I, think, I think perhaps Mike will touch on the fact that, that I think many questions in sleep, which are unknown, might, might be clarified, might be illuminated uh, by, by fly research, by Drosophila research, in, in really the way that, that uh, was done for circadian rhythms, although I suspect that some of you out there, you people who can make up sleep on Friday and Saturday and Sunday, will be the people to really do this. Thank you very much. So there is hope for us. <laughs>